Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Club Metaverse podcast. I am Mark Fernandez, and today I am joined by author, Bitcoin maximalist. I don't know if that's an, an appropriate term to use, but, uh, you know, longstanding author, professor as well at, at the University of Austin. Lecturer. Lecturer. Lecturer with the great Jimmy Song. Jimmy, how are you today? I didn't expect to be talking to a monkey. Um, <laughs> I... I, I, I I, 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 I'm doing good. Uh, I, yeah, this is not what I expected. Uh, okay, I'll well, say that much. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, 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 look. Fair enough. Let, let's dig into that a little bit. So, I, um, I've been doing podcasting for for quite some time. Typically in the entertainment space. I, 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 I owned uh, uh, several companies in that space. My last one was called Collider, and I had a quite a big podcast, but it was doing Star Wars stuff. You know. And, um, you know, the Hollywood Reporter, when I bought that company, I bought it in 2017 and I bought it completely with Ethereum. Um, and, you know, the Hollywood Reporter did probably its first story ever about Ethereum and stuff like that. So, look, bottom line is I like to experiment. I do love the idea that um, even in the in the application that I'm working on currently, that th the players get to own their own assets you know, like like very, very different from games like World of Warcraft back in the day um, where everything is around a closed system. And if you tried to like sell WoW gold or, or WoW characters, your account would be banned, you know, for, for understandable reasons. But, you know, the ability that I think NFTs are, are providing in the game space is a certain, uh, you know, new digital uh, asset class that can get integrated into these games that can build value for the player actually playing the game. So it's less renting and more, you know, you know, ownership. So for me with the monkey, it's just a little bit of a, of an experiment of how can I take a asset that's part of a larger media brand and completely exploit it in any way that I want without them having any oversight over it. You know, so for me, that's kind of my angle on it. But look, it's totally fair that you weren't expecting it and you think it's weird. Well, I, I, I think your assessment is completely off. I mean, you, you're you saying you're not in a closed ecosystem. Of course you are. As soon as you're off of Ethereum, it's, a, a, you know, like Ethereum is a closed system. It right. is controlled by Vitalik Buterin and his VC friends. It's 70% pre-mine. So for you to suggest that this is somehow that different than Blizzard Corporation is completely nonsense. What, what you have is uh, all of the things that you said are unique to NFTs or whatever it is that you're doing with it. The only reason it's different is because they're letting you speculate on it because they, they get around security laws by saying that they're decentralized when they really aren't. Really, if uh, Blizzard let you trade it, it wouldn't be very different than, uh, than what we have right now. Like if, if they let you trade swords for dollars or something like that, it would be exactly the same thing. I agree uh, 1,000%. Like, I, I, I don't understand this notion that it's something unique or new or different because it's not. It's a completely centralized system. You don't you you have ownership of your monkey character just like you do on World of Warcraft, like having a sword or something like that. So it, it's a complete mischaracterization, and I think you 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 have it all wrong. Um, essentially, you've made a lot of money in the Ethereum ecosystem. By uh, you know getting in early, be, perhaps being a, 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 a v, having a VC friend give you a kind tip or something like that. Right. But really, you're you're scamming a lot of people out of their money and thinking that uh, in thinking that these things are valuable when they're not. They're closed ecosystems. They're controlled by central parties, and they you have you you have to trust that Vitalik's not going to one day say, you know what. We're going to roll all that back just like we did with the Dow because it's uh, it's oh, look, it's happening. space and it's, it's going to. I, I I mean like I I just don't think that what uh, the all of the reasons that you said oh yeah you know it's a it's a different angle or whatever that's all bullshit and we all know that and but, I, I I I think it's uh, it's ridiculous to say that that you actually own it when you don't you you rent it at the at the pleasure of Vitalik you rent it at the pleasure of the Ethereum Foundation. And that's that's what it is. Um, and whatever other chain you're on, then maybe maybe you're under the pleasure of some. Uh, you you rent it at the pleasure of somebody else. But to suggest that it's a, something new and different, it's not. It, it's it's the same old thing being sold to you in a different dress. And to suggest that you you have something innovative or new or interesting when it's really a scam, I, I just don't think that's the case. 
Okay, so so lots lots to digest there. Um, number one, the the sort of the simplest one in terms of the difference between the WoW sword and the NFT, they are drastically different because one you can sell, one you cannot. Would well, you agree again, with that? you could you could sell the World of Warcraft sword, like you said. If Blizzard finds out about it, they'll ban your account. But pe plenty of people do. They have on eBay for a long oh, time. Oh, one thousand percent, one thousand percent. WoW Gold at one point was mm -hmm. you know one of the you know, actually later turned into a crypto company it was a billion dollar business at one point selling, you know, wow, gold and stuff like that. Of course, it was under outside of the terms of services. So it wasn't an actual offer. Yeah, so you, you did it at the pleasure of Blizzard. And if Vitalik at some point decides, you know what, we're not going to allow bored apes on, uh, on our platform because it's racist or something. Then right. you know you're you're out your stuff. It's exactly the same. I, the right. only thing is that the terms of service are slightly different. And uh, and the other thing is that because Ethereum is decentralized in name only, they, they get around all the security laws and everything else, which is why the Blizzard Corporation, which is clearly centralized, just like Ethereum is, doesn't let you do the, all those changes because then they would have to get money transmitter licenses and all the other stuff and all the sure. regulatory stuff. So really what you have are two exact same things. That get one getting around all of the regulation by pretending it's decentralized. The other that that is centralized and is actually honest about it and tries to comply with the law. Right, and, and um, no, no, I I hear your point. I hear your point. Um, do you think um, there's an example of an offshoot of Bitcoin that is doing it the right way, or do you think basically all the other coins, you know? Um, post um, kind of Ethereum are all in this kind of scam umbrella? I think all coins other than Bitcoin are scam are under that scam umbrella, just like you said. And it's because they have these massive pre-mines. There's all sorts of incentives for VCs to pump this stuff. They sit around in boardrooms trying to think of new narratives so that, that their uh, bags will keep pumping. And th this is how they make money. I mean, it's it's good for those VCs and their LPs, I guess. But uh, for the average user, for the people that are buying this stuff at like, you know, whatever valuation your board monkey is like that, the you know, they're, they're going to be the ones that get screwed. And this this happened in 2017. This happened in 2014, whatever. There's, there's so many projects where people make these unbelievable promises and they don't deliver. And, mm -hmm. and the thing is, like, people are thinking that this is something that they actually own when they actually don't. It, you have it at the pleasure of Vitalik. You have it at the pleasure of the Ethereum Foundation and so on. Um, and you know, we, we like this was completely proven like a few months ago with the Poly Network. Um, mm. You know, they, they there was a seven hundred million dollar hack or something like that, or it's not yeah, really yeah, a hack. Yeah. It was a smart contract, but right. basically they told the the hacker, uh, hey. If you don't give us uh, any of this back, you're you're never going to be able to cash it out because we've told all the miners and everybody else that to not do it. Now, if they could do that for this, why can't they do that for your board ape? You don't actually own it. There is no censorship resistance or anything like that. It's decentralized in name only. Okay, the hacker ended up settling for five hundred thousand dollars. So that means ninety nine point nine percent of the value of uh, of the tokens he took. Uh, were at the pleasure of the central controllers of it. And your your board ape is exactly the same. Your yeah, yeah. your Ethereum is exactly the same. All of the assets that are out there that are doing that, it's it's exactly the same. And it is a scam. And the only reason the uh, the SEC and all the all these places are allowing it is because they're slow and they don't understand what decentralization means or anything like that. And these these comp uh, these altcoins that keep saying, oh yeah, we're decentralized, so you can't regulate us. Well, you know, that that's going to come home to roost because at some point they're going to be like, oh, yeah, you are. You, you, you're you definitely like uh, some sort of security or something. You can't keep doing this. Um, they've defrauded people out of millions and billions of dollars. And um, and it's 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 a terrible thing. It's a terrible precedent. I, I, I think it's been very harmful to a lot of people. And, uh, you know, I, I, I resent even being compared or being put in the same space. Uh, or being g clumped together in crypto, as it were, uh, with, with, with scams like that. It just doesn't make any sense. Yeah. First of all, I, I hear all your points. And as somebody who's been around uh, Ethereum from the very beginning, um, you know, we had a, a massive fork back in the early days that, to your point, 
was extremely controversial because they were able uh, to do that fork post hack without, you know, any kind of sort of decentralized governance around it, you know, and, you know, we've kind of forgotten about it now because it turned out to be good for the coin itself. But um, I hear your point that at any point, if for whatever reason, the Ethereum Foundation says, okay, board apes are not allowed on our uh, uh, blockchain anymore, they can just kill the contract and they can kill the addresses and, 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 and that's the end of being able to trade it. Yeah. I mean, I, I think you're making my point. Again, it's not very different than Blizzard, the corporation. And if they did get under all these money transmission laws and everything else, then that's exactly what they would have to do is say, oh, you're not. I mean, these are game assets. You can't you can't trade them without a money transmitter license. Um, you know, that that could be used for money laundering or something like that. So therefore, you can't do this anymore. Um, and that that's that's a sort of Damocles that that's hanging over um every one of these projects and because they're decentralized in name only they're they're the possibility of regulation sits out there like a sword and you i mean at some point it all just kind of goes away and yeah uh you know like the, the, and a lot of people just don't understand this they think oh it's decentralized they don't actually understand what decentralized means it's decentralized in name only it's it's a it's a fraud on a scale that's like enormous like uh, that that's almost unprecedented and and, and it, like uh you know a, a lot of uh, podcasters uh that you know they they go out there and make these claims about it being decentralized oh it's a new asset it's doing this it's doing that really it, it's it's a it's a horrible mischaracterization and it's uh it, it's an it's a regulatory arbitrage play that is bound to you know that the loophole will be closed at some point it's not gonna right. work it's basically what you're saying is that it's basically anything that's not named Bitcoin. It's kind of like living in a condo. Like you own the apartment, but you don't own the building. And at any point, if the building, you know, goes through some drastic change, you know, but I guess the condo analogy has like the board and stuff, which is, you know, like the equivalent. But anyway, to jump forward, something that is as sort of become as ubiquitous as Ethereum what what kind of reforms would you suggest that Ethereum take to actually be more in line with the decentralized promise that 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 you're alluding to? Well, I would stop the chain. Um, I would return everybody uh, whatever funds from the treasury that they have, which is largely uh, well, some of it at least is in Bitcoin and uh and 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 return their money uh right like uh, as much as possible and to try to make things right uh but i i don't think the chain as it exists has any possibility of decentralization and is that because of the kind of uh, a mining model like 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 what makes bitcoin fully decentralized and ethereum not decentralized like for well, somebody who doesn't really understand it yeah so ethereum has a controller they have a foundation they have people that uh, you're you're forced to upgrade uh, software if you want to keep in consensus with uh, Ethereum. So, you know, Bitcoin's uh, you know consensus model is that it's who anyone that is running a node essentially has a vote. Um, you 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 decide what is Bitcoin for you. With Ethereum, the core devs of Ethereum decide what Ethereum is, and you're either in consensus with them or out of consensus with them. If you're out of consensus with them, it's not Ethereum. It, it just isn't. Mm -hmm. And if you if you are in consensus with them, then it is Ethereum. So they control exactly what Ethereum is. Um, so that that's a big difference. There's a there's a central entity that decides what Ethereum is. In Bitcoin, there's no central entity that does that. It's it's everybody that's running or no, they get to decide. Um, and that that's a huge difference. And every altcoin is more in uh, is like Ethereum. You have to follow the consensus of whatever the small group of uh, controllers is. Whereas mm -hmm. with Bitcoin, every user is sovereign for themselves. If uh, and you know we we saw that with Bitcoin Cash and these other forks and so on. Um, they were like, okay, well we're gonna go and say that this other thing is Bitcoin. Well, they they didn't do very well, but they had the right to do that because right. that that's something that uh, you know in a decentralized system you can't stop anybody. Um, but you know, like with, with Ethereum, it's whatever Vitalik says or whatever the Ethereum Foundation says, whatever the Ethereum core devs say, they're they're the ones that control it, and I I. I don't see a way around that because they've had so many different 
uh, changes to their stuff. They're going to move to Ethereum 2.0 with sharding and yeah. proof of stake and all this other stuff. That that's dictated on high, right? Like that's that that's somebody from above telling everybody else how it's going to be. That's the definition of centralized. Um, right. You're you're not getting away from that by changing something technical. It it it, it has to be. We're we're not even really sure that it's possible to to ever do that again. Like uh, you know, in Bitcoin, it was almost like an immaculate consumption. It's a, uh, it, it like sort of emerge it emerged as a property mostly after Satoshi left. Mm. But with every other coin, it's you know the holder uh, the the founders sold some uh, you know most of them like did a huge pre mine, gave it to their VCs to pump the hell out of it. Uh, the VCs have obliged them, pumped the hell out of it, and gotten a ton of gains off of the public. Um, and you know, like they, that, that's fine for them, I guess. But they're they're preying on retail, which I think is predatory. Um, and you know, like they they have no interest in decentralization. In fact, like uh, you know, coins like Solana are getting even more centralized. It's right. it, it, it's that that's the trend. And the thing is, like. They still keep the decentralization moniker, so they stop getting regulated from all the different laws that they're probably violating. Um, and th this, like, at some point, this is going to come home to roost. E enough people get hurt, uh, which I think is inevitable. It's already happened in, in in places like Korea, where, you know, like the ICO bubble in 2017 was like insanely bad. Um, and you know, they passed a bunch of laws saying you can't originate ICOs here and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. You're gonna see stuff like that happen in the U.S. too. And, um, you know, like, which, well, like that, which, which it already is kind of happened in the U.S. Like, yeah, like in the I, US, that, which is unsustainable will not be sustained. And the thing is, there, there's a single point of failure whenever you have centralized things and they, it will get regulated. I, it, we, we saw with what, what was it, MetaMask or something where, you know, they banned Russian users um, and OpenSea, they, they also banned Russian users. It's like, OK, how are you decentralized if you're able to ban a whole swath of people? That yeah. doesn't make any sense. So, um, you know, at some point, they'll probably go to the Ethereum Foundation and say, if you mine a block, uh, you know, if anyone mines a block um, from uh, including transactions from these addresses, then uh, we're going to come and arrest you. And the, they'll they'll release a fork of their uh, their stuff saying having a ban list or something like that. I, like there, there's so many ways in which the, this thing could uh, could get controlled by the state. So it, it, it it's not decentralized, guys. Like it, it never has been. It never was. It never mm. will be. So like it's not. And it, as these abuses become more and more obvious to regulators and other people, you know, I like maybe you keep the scam going for another five years. Maybe you keep it going for another six months. I have no idea, but. Right. At some point, this is coming, um, and you know it, it, it's it's going to die. Um, I, I don't know when it is, but it's going to die. That that that's my message to your audience. And, and what about what about this kind of emergence in the past? You know, I'd say sort of you know twelve eighteen months of the trend um, of a lot of these projects trying to create uh, these DAOs, these decentralized quote unquote autonomous orgs that are running. Uh, the governance over these tokens. What what's your thought on that? Is that a, is that a step in the right direction, or is that more smoke and mirrors? It, well, I mean, it's it's worse than smoke and mirrors. It's 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 plainly not decentralized. If if you're voting for something, that's still a centralized system, right? Like if mm. you if if you're uh, and you know a lot of coins think that somehow de democracy equals decentralization. They're completely different governance systems. Decentralized systems require consensus, everyone to agree. Democracy just requires a majority. Um, th those are Ooh, very, very different things. That's an interesting, uh, um, um, you know, specific um, attribute of decentralization equals consensus versus democracy that equals majority. That's an interesting um, notion for me to ponder a little bit later. I like yeah, that. and that and that's the thing. It, it, like you, you add things like democracy and make it feel better for people because they associate good things with democracy, maybe. But it's not decentralized. It's still centralized. There's a central, you know, uh, place where all the decisions are made and so on, and it can just as easily be subverted as any other central entity. Um, now, of course, like if you actually look at the stats of these DAOs or whatever, it's like the VCs that control like significant portions or the founders that control sure. significant portions. So 
it like in practice it's not decentralized in any way any like it, the, the the founders control it right it's like mark zuckerberg with facebook uh in theory like uh the shareholders have some say or whatever but his his shares get 10 times the voting rights or something like that so he still like controls the company it, right like no matter what what you say so um yeah it's 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 complete like they people throw in the word decentralized like it's uh it's sprinkles or something on an, on, on an ice cream <laughs> it, it's it's nothing like that everything that we know in nature that's actually decentralized it it's it it's very very it's a difficult property to go go and get yeah and no, it's no, not that's... something that you sprinkle on it's a it, technically it's just very very difficult to get it's uh and it's very easy to centralize it's very hard to go from in fact we've only really seen it once with uh, with bitcoin like it's hard to go from centralized to decentralized um and that that that's like something that a lot of people don't understand they throw this term around like it's something that they really uh think they have a good grasp on or something like that they they have no idea because they're not technical people they just believe vcs or something like that who have an incentive to get them to believe uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, the VC narrative. So, you know, I, I'm the one guy telling you the truth. The, this stuff is all centralized and it's a scam. And uh, like get out before all of the stuff collapses. Right. So so the the Bitcoin uh, um, model or, or not the Bitcoin model, but the Bitcoin story. Um, and I did a documentary on it years ago. Um, and I forget all the names involved currently, but Basically, um, the the Bitcoin um, protocol itself has been iterated upon um, since its inception back in in, in two thousand eight, or mm -hmm. and so you're saying that that group that continues to evolve the code base is somehow receiving one hundred percent absolute consensus from the folks that are managing the nodes that are mining the token. And the second that there isn't this consensus, then it essentially forks into something different, like you know your example, Bitcoin Cash, or or you know something like this. So um, it's interesting. I got to wrap my head around that more because look, I'm not a super technical guy, even though I you know I I run a technical company. I myself am not super in the weeds. I have been around Bitcoin, uh, you know, from the what I consider to be very early days. I bought my first Bitcoin on MT Gox back in the day. So you're probably familiar with, with that and all that stuff. Um, I've gone down the rabbit hole into who Satoshi is and everything. Um, and, and I can't really now that, that you kind of challenge my brain around this, I can't really think of other projects that follow that kind of absolute decentralized um, sort of ethos um just off the top of my head i guess bitcoin cash technically is also fully decentralized but no no it's completely centralized because they they hard forked so they they told everybody if you want to be on bitcoin cash then you have to upgrade your software and like if you if you're not running their software you're not running bitcoin cash um, and they they do hard forks every six months or force upgrades every six months and every time you do a force upgrade like all the rules kind of go out the window, right? Like right. anything can be changed. And Ethereum's done this many, many times where they'll be like, you know what? This was the supply schedule. We're not going to change that supply schedule to this other supply schedule or sure. whatever. It, it, it's, 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 this is not very different than the Fed saying, you know what? Our guidance is, the, uh, you know, this, this, and then, you know, uh, we're, we might change our mind at any time. Like, if there's arbitrariness in in what's what's coming and you're forced to do something then it's centralized if 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 at any point you're forced to do something then it's centralized because somebody is forcing you and that that somebody is is the centralized uh, entity what about what about bitcoin satoshi vision or sv i forget exactly what the uh, what the acronym is yeah they is, they but... all hard fork and they they all are based on the same scammy sort of like model of have some, you know, personality that, uh, that will pump the whole heck out of it. And, you know, this is the thing about all coins and everything else. It's all driven by marketing and it's almost all pure marketing. Um, and the more of a marketing hype cycle that you get, the better it is for the coin because more people come into it because they don't really, they can't challenge the technical, 
you know, uh, you know, premises or whatever, and they don't know who to believe. They just see price going up. It's like VCs pumping it or whatever. Okay, I better get in this. And then uh, because they're invested, they they have no real motivation to see the flaws in it or all the risks that are involved with it. And they say, well, I I made five times my money, so you know, I'm the genius. Uh, instead of you know looking at it from a technical perspective or what it's actually supposed to do or what the underlying value is. We've gone towards like this valuation model is that's completely postmodern, which is if you make money, everything is okay. It doesn't matter if it's a scam right. or not. Um, and that, that's, that to me is horribly morally degenerate. And, mm. uh, and it, 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 it proceeds sort of like a societal collapse because like it, it has to be tethered to reality if it's not tethered to reality and you start investing in bankrupt companies because you can make it pump like wall street bets does sure. um, then then all the money's going towards the wrong things and you're just making a few people rich um that's what's happening in the altcoin space it's it's all sorts of people that are getting rich for different reasons not contributing anything to society that not not building anything that anyone needs. It's all a game of speculative frenzy and degenerate gambling and trading or whatever. <laughs> yeah. First of all, it sounds fairly accurate to my uh, to my world a little bit. So so it's hard to argue with those points. Um, do so. I take it that by what you're saying, you don't believe Craig Wright was integral into the original uh, white paper, and and Craig Wright is not Satoshi. I don't think that guy could code himself out of a paper bag, um, much less like uh, be you know create a beautiful system like uh, Bitcoin. The, the guy's a known fraudster. He has uh, you know been convicted of all kinds of fraud in all kinds of places. He's lied many many times. It's shown over and over and over again. I don't know why anyone would take this guy seriously, except that he has some something of a reality distortion field over some certain people. I don't know why. Right. And I'm glad that I'm not one of those people that, you know, that's subject to that or susceptible to that. But he seems to have that over a certain group of people and they will follow him everywhere. And the thing is, like, it really kind of reminds me of a cult where, you know, like they'll they'll believe anything that he says. Um, you know, like I think there was a video of Ryan X. Charles saying, like, I think Craig might be Jesus or something like that. And it, it, <laughs> It was it. It's uh. It's absolutely like insane to me that yeah. there uh. You know, like people have that level of faith in this guy after he's shown over and over again that he's a complete fraud. So I I don't know. I mean, like I honestly, I'm I'm a libertarian. You know, you 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 do you. Um, and if you think he's Satoshi, good luck to you. I I I had I I made that determination that he's not. Oh, he's uh, definitely, so, yeah. you know, like my, my kind of, and I've interviewed Craig two times and, you know, like I went down this rabbit hole, like maybe four years ago, did a whole like documentary that I never even put out because I was so unsure of, you know, typically when you make a documentary, you ask yourself a question. My question was, who is Satoshi? And at the end of it, if you don't have a great answer, it doesn't feel like a complete work, you know? Hmm. Um, but what I kind of found was that this whole Satoshi Nakamoto thing was really more of a group of people that consisted of about four or five different people. Two of them, you know, forgive me, I forget their names, passed away, sadly. Um, and, you know, it seemed like the very first person who got the very first Bitcoin transaction, I think his name is, was last name was Klein or, God, I forget his name right now. It, uh, I'm, I'm spacing on it, but he passed away. Um, and, you know, and still to this day, there's a million Bitcoins sitting in, in a wallet that no one has ever moved. And to me, that's like the most amazing thing about Bitcoin, really. Like if you try to explain the wonders of Bitcoin is this one example that there's a million Bitcoins sitting in a wallet that has never moved. Do you think if those million Bitcoins were a million Ethereum sitting in a wallet, of course, those could be moved, you know, pretty easily. Right. So it's it. it, it like it just shows that Bitcoin does have this special like iron fence around it that like we we just haven't been able, you know, to crack. And and never in history has there been such an incredible invention with an inventor who was anonymous, you know, like 
We have no idea who this guy was. We have no idea if it was a group of people or, or whatever. And it's still like a mystery that I don't know if it'll ever be solved. Do you think it'll get solved one day? And do you think it matters? I don't think it matters. Um, I mean, Bitcoin is out into the world already. Um, I honestly like, uh, you know, th this topic fascinates people because they don't know. And it's something that's easily graspable. It's, uh, you know, like ever since Deep Throat or something like that, there's this sure. sort of like mystery element to it and people want to know and there's a curiosity about it. Honestly, like, uh, you know, it, it, it doesn't matter. And like if you if you're actually technical, you would probably be of the opinion that it's one person, not a group, like you said. Like if you actually read the code, it's like, OK, there, there are certain stylistic things that are consistent throughout the whole thing. So it's it's probably not a group. It's probably a single person. And, uh, and whoever it was, uh, you know, did, did a good job. And, uh, the thing is, like, there, there are much more difficult things to understand that are far more consequential. Mm. Um, and that like learning what decentralization actually means, for example. Yeah. And, uh, and, and it frustrates me that people would rather focus on who Satoshi is, which is granted a lot easier to understand, a lot cooler of a mystery uh, in, in terms of like pop culture and, you know, or whatever. Sure. But like trying to figure out the mystery of what decentral, like what brings on decentralization and how it comes to pass and stuff like that. That's far more interesting. And like the consequences mm -hmm. of having something that's digital, decentralized and scarce, that's extremely interesting because it's it's changing society as we know it. And we're, we're seeing the mm -hmm. ability to transfer value like almost instantaneously across the globe and having the store of value that is like harder than any other asset that we've ever seen. The, these are all things that require academic study that require a lot of pondering by people, technologists and so on th to really see sort of like what what are some of the consequences that come out of this? In instead, we have people buying bored apes or something like that. That to me is really <laughs> frustrating like that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah uh, you're, you're making some money, but you're not progressing civilization in any meaningful way. Um, and that that that's that's very frustrating because it's like, OK, we, we we've basically been given this amazing tool for human freedom, for self-sovereignty, for mm -hmm. our ability to protest against governments that would control us, um, that that gives us freedom. And you want to, you know, spend time on a drooling chimp or something I, like it doesn't make any sense to me. Like uh, like wh why? Well, I mean, I, it does make sense. It's because the VCs think that this is how they're going to make their money. And they, they, they'd they rather be pumping their own bags rather than making civilization progress. So so, so how do you think the Bitcoin philosophy can scale to other aspects of life, like, like government, for example? I mean, having complete consensus at a government scale or a sociopolitical scale seems unrealistic and, and like inhuman almost. Like, how do you think those like BTC can scale to that level? Well, it, it doesn't need to. Uh, not everything has to have that governance model. And in fact, it would be a very bad idea if everyone had to agree uh, to make like some communal decision or whatever. But, you know, I, I, I am of the opinion that, uh, you know, large nation states exist right now because of monetary reasons. Uh, you mm. know, like within a border, you have the same currency or whatever. That's why they tend to be large contiguous land masses or whatever. Um, you know, having something like Bitcoin and, uh, you know, like removing the need for sort of fiat currency means that you can have much smaller states and more experimentation and more... Um, you know, different ways to try stuff and having uh, different, uh, you know, sets of rights in different jurisdictions. I think I, I think that would be hu huge for human flourishing and stuff like that. Um, the thing is, like for a lot of, uh, you know, what what's going on, it, it, it is dependent on the fiat monetary system. And, you know, the U.S. dollar hegemony is largely responsible for the uh, state of the world as it is right now. Um, you know, and, and, you know, that's uh, caused all kinds of conflicts and mm. kept peace and others and stuff like that. Um, the, these are things that unfortunately, like, uh, if you're, if you're in the altcoin space, you don't talk about at all because you'd rather be, you know, 
talking about what coins pumping next or what DeFi protocol will get you the most yield or some sure. ridiculous thing like that, rather than, okay, you know, like how do we help the people in Turkey or Lebanon or Nigeria, like actually, you know, flourish, right. Or uh, get out from the thumb of the central banks that try to control their money. Um, like these are important questions. These are questions of civilization, um, yeah. you know, scale, right? Like that, the, and, and that, that's what we talk about in Bitcoin, uh, in the altcoin space. It's, uh, yo, I, 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 I just got this, uh, this new JPEG or something. And now I can, uh, I can go buy a Lambo. Like, I, I guess that, I mean, you do you, I guess, but I, I see it as completely, I don't know, pointless and meaningless and purposeless and, it, it, uh, it, it just saddens me that, that that's what drives people, uh, the, this uh, pursuit of money at all costs, rather than, you know, doing something good for civilization and building something that people can use. Uh, and mm -hmm. uh, it, it's, it, it's almost like nihilistic to me. It's, it's also narcissistic. It's, it, it's, uh, it's a philosophy that's uh, like not admirable in any way. It, it's, it's just, you know, it, it's, there's nothing there. I, I don't know. Right. Right. Yeah. So, so look, it, look, it's interesting because I understand your point that there's this kind of alternative method that the sort kind of, you know, post Ethereum um, has given us to accumulate, you know, wealth um, in, in the crypto space. Um, and a lot of it is speculation. Look, I'm, I'm involved in making a VR, um, you know, game right now. And, as I study the space around me, um, I've been in the video game industry since 2001. So I've been, I've been making games my whole life. Um, and a lot of these games that are out there that are, you know, have evaluations that are higher than take two interactive higher than like some of the biggest game companies in the world don't even have a game. You know, they only have a discord group with like 50,000 people. And that's the only liquidity that they have is people talking about, this thing that might come out one day that is going to be the best thing in the world and the company based on its you know market value or market cap in ethereum is bigger than some of the biggest game companies in the world that have been doing this for 30 years and you know all that is driven by this crazy speculation that even to me is a little bit frustrating right because in my game i was like no i'm going to build the game first that you know that's the first thing i'm going to do I'm going to let people actually start playing it. And then hopefully I can build up my, my momentum that way. Um, so, so I hear your point on the speculation and it is a little bit scary because things that speculate have a tend to, you know, uh, bubble out, right. And drop. And a lot of people, you know, get hurt. Um, and that's why the U S actually, I believe it was in 2018 or something made it that you can't really invest into these things without you know, going through the proper KYC accredited investor stuff, you know, so there has been some regulation around it, which I believe is, is good. Cause a lot of people do get hurt. Look, I've, I've lost a ton of money on, on rug jobs, you know, like I ape in to something and then I, you know, it pumps for a few days. I'm stupid and I don't sell it because my mentality is around Bitcoin. Cause when I bought Bitcoin at nine bucks, it went up to a thousand. Then it started collapsing and I got scared and I sold all of it. Mm -hmm. I got completely out. And then now it, you know, it is where it is. So it kind of taught me this, you know, this philosophy of hold, you know, of the hodl or, you know, hold on for dear life uh, type stuff. And that philosophy can hurt you in the altcoin space, because if you don't know when to sell, you could lose a lot of friggin' money. Well, I mean, the, the thing is all coins trade and promises, right? And this, it, it's very similar to fiat money in that way. It's all built on promises that they don't keep. And th this is when you get bankruptcy or uh, currency collapse or whatever. Um, all dollars issued are loans and loans are promises to pay it back or whatever. Mm -hmm. And th this is this is what all coins all do is they promise the world and it trades on sort of like the ability to fulfill that promise possibly or that that should be the underlying thing. But again, you get into this sort of like postmodern investing philosophy of uh, we'll, we're going to make it pump. And if it pumps, then that's it. Like there's no underlying value or uh, any reality that it's attached to. It's just it pumps because it pumps. It drops because it drops. And that's it. 
and you get ridiculous valuations on these games that don't exist that are greater than like these companies that that did all that stuff so it, it's 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 a complete scam um in that way because it's trading in promises and you there there's no guarantee on promises bitcoin is different because it's trading on a real asset it's it's a it's bitcoins and there's no promises on bitcoin other than what it is it's digitally scarce money uh right. and and that that's what it is you know with if you're buying anything else it's oh we're bringing these features and that features and and really you're putting your trust in whoever is making that promise whether it's vitalik or hodgkinson or i don't know garlinghouse or whoever um and that the those are very very different things and when you're sort of like um you know trading on promises it, it, you do get like a very speculative bubble and stuff. Um, but if you if you don't keep your promise, I mean, like, and all of the uh, like, almost all of these projects have like some sort of promise or whatever. If you're if you're sure. not keeping your promise, then what what the hell is it other than fraud? This is this is why I call it a scam. Like right. you, you you make a promise, you keep your promise, or you. Uh, and the thing is, like, all of these tokens, if you look at like the terms and conditions or whatever for buying in the presale or something like that. They say you have no rights whatsoever. You 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 can't expect anything. It's a donation or whatever. People do it anyway because they know the VCs are going to pump it and market it to that. So it, it's it's all speculative. It's all fraudulent. And th this is why I I I've, I've been like railing against the space for so long. Sure. Uh, like people don't want to hear it, right? Like it, it, and you know I I'll give credit to you because you're hearing me out on this stuff. I'll, I'll go on another podcast and talk about this stuff. And they're just like, oh, can we talk about something? They'll, they'll, they'll constantly change the subject. Oh, no, it's very important to hear other people's opinions. And obviously you've done your homework and you've, you know, you're, you're, you're learning this at a very deep li uh, level. And look, fundamentally, the stuff that you're saying is, is correct. You know, the philosophy of Bitcoin and its decentralization model is different than the Ethereum model. Look, I'm a fan of Ethereum. I've been a fan of Ethereum since I bought my first, you know, ETH back in the day. I've been through the ups and downs of it. Um, I love the concept of smart contracts and what that can evolve to as as a decentralized computing platform where we technically don't, you know, have this kind of like networked CPU. Um, you know, that kind of stuff excites me, you know, but to your point, where is it all going? What's the big mission? Well, I mean, it's, a, it's all a scam. It's all centralized. So there's no point in having a blockchain except to get around regulation. And that arbitrage opportunity will close. Right. So like at, at, at that point, it, you might as well be centralized and you'll be able to do things faster, easier, uh, you know, like more upgradably and uh, give better service for you know, like doing everything gets easier and faster once you centralize it. Uh, and it already is. So that that's the direction that you might as well go. But they have to keep this like decentralized fiction in order to continue their scam. And the thing is, like the thing that people don't like is, seem to be in denial about with Ethereum is that 70 percent was pre mined and given to like VCs and whoever got in early. And those are the people that really control Ethereum is they, they, they have chunks of it. It's in their interest to pump the hell out of it, make you believe that it can do things that it can't, make you believe that the promises that Vitalik uh, you know, makes on a, on a weekly basis have some uh, nugget of truth in them or something like that, or that they'll be fulfill <laughs> fulfilled. It's, it's, it, it's all like really horrible incentive al alignment for fraud and scam and that that's essentially what's been happening over like the last six seven years of ethereum's history um you know mm -hmm. i mean you can even go back to the initial token sale in like 2014 or whatever it, it's been that way for a very long time mm -hmm. and the thing is like it, all, all of these things um are fine uh, work fine until it doesn't and you know like you know, you, you you might have some Ethereum and uh, and you know make 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 some money off of it. Like, have you actually done anything, right? Like, have you bettered civilization in some way by doing that? Because you own a JPEG of some uh, some you know uh, eight bit crypto punk or something like that. Like, no, you you have not. You've not. You've done nothing. Uh, all you've right. done is 
like gotten in on some fraud and managed to make money uh, without adding any value to society. How do you live with yourself? Right. Like managed to make money that? if you liquidate it, right? If you don't liquidate it, you made no, no money, you lost money, you know? Yeah. In which case you're, you're the victim of fraud, but in a <laughs> sense, it's a, you're, you're, you're like all of this, like, uh, you know, thrives on human vice of greed, envy, and, you know, like, pride, I guess. It, it's all sort of there to uh, to make you a worse person to me. Uh, whereas with Bitcoin, it's, uh, you know, like there's this idea of saving and having a low time preference and all this other stuff. And th this is this is the frustration I have because we're like, these are very, very different things. Bitcoin is one thing, all coins are completely another. So, and we get lumped in the same, same category. It, let, it doesn't make sense. Let me ask you a very specific question about Bitcoin as a currency, because one of my biggest regrets in life is that around 2017, I liquidated a bunch of Bitcoin to buy a car. Um, mm. And I regret that every time I think about it, I'm even selling the car you know, now because it's like this lingering regret that I have. Do you think Bitcoin is a is a viable currency in that sense? Or do you think it's really more of a of a saving store of value? Keep it away for one day. You can, you know, cash in the entire thing. Like what what are your thoughts about that, about Bitcoin as a currency versus something like the dollar that's pretty stable in its sort of value, even though obviously that changes a lot, too. But you know, with Bitcoin, the price has gone up so much that like all I have is regret every single time I've used it as a currency. Well, it, you, what, what you're talking about is spending it. Uh, and this this is really the thing about, um, you know, like Bitcoin versus the U.S. dollar. Uh, it goes up in U.S. dollar terms, uh, partly because pe more people are recognizing what it is, but also because they're printing a lot of dollars. Um, if you look at any collectible or real estate or whatever, they've all gone up way higher than sort of like the rate of money printing. Um, so you look at real estate, for example, a lot of homes have like doubled in price over two years. And yeah, that, yeah. You know, like if you look at the monetary expansion rate, it's like, uh, you know, 40 percent, which is not insignificant. It's that's a significant, but it's not as high as 100 percent, which is what what these things are going up. But it, it's kind of like inflation has this um, this property of sort of pumping certain assets while not pumping others. So mm -hmm. uh, I think eggs, for example, are fairly steady, although even those have gone up and so on. So, right. um, you know, like to the reason why people measure everything in dollars is because it's a dominant global currency. And that's uh, a historical fact from us essentially winning world war II. Sure. But that, that, that's a, that's a part of uh, why people are nervous about like spending Bitcoin in your case, or even getting into Bitcoin because of the volatility. Uh, but that that's a natural volatility because the market, doesn't know how to price it and there's uh there's a lot of traders that make things worse because they swing trade and things like that um but ultimately what you get is two different assets that are not tracking with each other um and you have the dollar which tracks a certain way and you have bitcoin that tracks another way the only way you you can sort of link that is something like a central bank so every mm -hmm country in the world that's not the US does this. So if you're the Bank of Japan, you you watch the Japanese yen to US dollar exchange rate pretty closely. And if it gets too high, uh, you'll you'll buy some dollars. Uh, I mean, you'll you'll buy back your own currency. Uh, and if it gets too low, you'll sell your currency. Um, and you know, th this is how every central bank manages sort of mm -hmm. like a peg range with the dollar and that can be fairly steady. But with Bitcoin, you don't have a central bank because it's decentralized, you, you don't have any of that. Uh, so you, you get this uh, sort of like fluctuation, but that's okay, at least if you're holding for the long term. No one's ever lost money holding Bitcoin for five years. Um, and if you do that, you'll be okay. And if you bought at any time in 2017, you did fine. Now, there's a wide range within that. Sure. Uh, and you know, like there, there's, you know, timing and things like that, which, uh, which, you know, depending on where you come from, that, that, that might be, uh, something you're good at or whatever. Um, 
But you know, the the reality is that Bitcoin and the dollar are, you know, like they're not going to be correlated. And to expect that is kind of a ridiculous thing. Now, to your question, are people going to use it as like daily currency? They they already kind of do, right? Um, mm. uh, like uh, you know, there's a lot of people that transact on Lightning. If you go to El Salvador, you'll see a lot of people, um, you know, paying with Lightning and so on. Uh, now, do you have to keep your money in uh, in Bitcoin? If you're saving for the long term, that's probably a good idea. If you're going to save it for five years uh, or like hold it for five years, that's going to be a good idea. It'll do way better than the dollar. Yeah. On a day to day basis, um, it can get a little bit tricky. But then again, like if, if you believe, as I do, that going, uh, you know, going higher is inevitable because of its uh, absolute scarcity, then. You know, keeping it in dollars, uh, keeping it in uh, Bitcoin versus dollars, uh, even over the short term, might make sense. So. Oh yeah, you can't you can't convince me. I've learned my lesson. You know, I've been around mm -hmm. this so long that you can't even like like talk to me about selling my Bitcoin. I just won't do it. You know, it's mm -hmm. it's something. I only buy Bitcoin. I don't sell Bitcoin. So look, this typically I ask. We're, we're running out of time, and you've been very gracious with your time, and I appreciate that. And I typically ask this at the beginning. But I'm fascinated to know how you got started in Bitcoin. Kind of what 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 like what was your kind of nascent story about learning about Bitcoin? Yeah, so I learned about it in 2011 when I saw a story on Slash that, that said Internet only currency Bitcoin has reached dollar parity, um, and I didn't know anything about the story, but I dug into it and I found out about its 21 million limit. Um, now I was well positioned because I'm a coder and I knew roughly how it would work. Um, and I was I, I was also a libertarian. I still am um, from 2008 and all the things that happened. So I dug into sort of like how money worked and what the problems with money were. And when I saw it, I got it fairly quickly. Uh, and, you know, for a lot of other people, it takes them many years of learning sure. about Austrian economics or about technology or about public key cryptography or whatever to really kind of get why this is significant. For me, it wasn't that hard because I happened to have the right knowledge to really get it when I first saw it. Uh, so that that's how I got it. Um, but. Of course, back then it was really difficult to buy Bitcoin and uh, right. it took me a while to actually get in and buy it. Uh, but once I did um, and a as it proved itself over time, you know, I, I learned more about it. I learned more about Austrian economics. I learned about the code that's underneath and I really sort of dug in and read what, what was going on. And that's 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 where I am. And did you um, have any kind of opinion on the matter that because back in those days, Bitcoin was kind of this. This is how I heard about it. Was I heard about it through Silk Road? You know, Silk Road mm -hmm. was this kind of popular site back in those days. People could say, "Oh, you could buy drugs on it," and I never bought drugs on it or anything. But I always heard about people using this weird new currency to, like, you know, trade in the black market. Were you kind of aware of its sort of Bitcoin black market connection back in the day? I mean, that's its first use case, right, as a black market currency. Yeah, I, I, of course I knew about it. Um, I, I think, um, I believe Silk Road came online sometime in 2011 or may, maybe, yeah, so, sometime middle of 2011. So I, I, I heard about it and I, I, I was aware of it. Um, but, you know, I mean, I, I don't do drugs. So <laughs> I, <laughs> right. I had no interest in, in, in any of that. Uh, although I've, I've done some research and one of, one of the most popular items on the Silk Road was Staples coupons, apparently like, <laughs> right. people, like I'm, OK, that kind of makes sense, because if you want to have a coupon to get 20 bucks off of uh, Staples or something and you, you pay like a dollar, you know, that that would make sense. Of course, uh, you know, like keeping the the money in Bitcoin would have been a far better investment. But, you know, I mean, like that's how people used it. The thing is, like. I don't think that was as uh, big a use case as we thought. And we, we saw mm -hmm. that in later later in 2013. Ross Ulbricht got arrested on like October 1st, 2013. And then over the next six weeks, like Bitcoin went on a bull run like crazy, like $100 oh, yeah. to 1100 And this was because everyone thought that this, this was the end of Bitcoin. And when it didn't die, people were like, oh, yeah, this this is this is actually right. something it, it, it like proved its resilience and its decentralized nature. I mean, um, that's when we had our first crash, because I remember that's when I sold was 2013. Hmm. 
Yeah. So, I, there, there, were, there were many things that happened in 2013. Uh, we can relive those days sometime. Yeah. So, um, all right. So last question. Um, is there any crypto project out there, any blockchain out there that you do believe, aside from Bitcoin, is following? No. no not one. No. no. Uh, wow. they, they're not decentralized. So the thing is, like, in order for it to be interesting, it has to be decentralized. If it's centralized, then it's no different than fiat currency, right? Like, you can add bored apes to the U.S. dollar, right? Like, the Fed could release a CBDC that has bored apes. They right. can also have, uh, you know, DeFi protocol on there. It wouldn't make it interesting to me because, and I wouldn't want to do anything with it because it's a freaking U.S. government, right? Uh, and sure. to me, all of these altcoins that are, you know, trying different tech or whatever, like it, it's kind of missing the point. What we need is better money, not better tech. Like yeah. you could, you could have additional tech, and the Fed can add all the bells and whistles at once. I still don't want it because it's controlled by a central entity and it can get co-opted. It can like, I don't have sovereignty over my own money. I don't have actual property. I'm using it at their pleasure, which is, which is what happens with your bank account, right? Like if you, if they accuse you of being a child pornographer or something, they'll just take your account. Uh, if they say that, uh, you know, you, uh, you know, they have civil asset forfeiture, there's all sorts of ways in which they can just sort of take your stuff. That means that you don't really possess it. That means that you have it at their pleasure. You're renting it or you have use of it until they say no. Um, and that's the case with every altcoin because they're centralized. You, mm -hmm. you have access to it while they give you permission. But as soon as they stop giving permission or are forced to stop giving you permission, maybe through some government mandate or something like that, you no longer have it. And that, that, that's, that to me is the critical thing. All coins are centralized. Bitcoin is decentralized, which is why I focus on Bitcoin. It's the only thing that's actually interesting. Well, you've given me a lot to think about. Um, um, a lot of what you're saying, I actually completely agree with mm -hmm. on a fundamental level. And some of the other stuff you're saying with, I'm in conflict with only because to your point, I'm making money off of it, right? And, and, and other people are too. So, you know, money is a great pacifier. Um, but, uh, look, Jimmy, um, I'm going to link all your books below. Um, you've written four major books, correct? Yeah. Um, here, here are some of them. Here's Bitcoin and the American dream. Yeah. There's the little Bitcoin book. There's thank God for Bitcoin and programming <laughs> Bitcoin. So I, oh, I have four awesome. books. Um, you can, you can find all of them on Amazon. And, and, and on a last last quick question, the the actual programming language that Bitcoin was built on is what? C plus plus and uh, yeah, I think it was all C plus plus. There was a little bit of Python for testing that was put in there later. Got it. So it's all C plus plus because now Ethereum uses this new language, liquidity or or some no, not, not solidity. Solidity. That, right? Solidity is the smart contract language. Bitcoin smart contract language is called Script. Um, and yeah, but the actual language that Ethereum is written on, I believe there's um, a Go implementation. There's a there's several implementations. Um, yeah, but you know, like it, it's it's more it's more meant to be a protocol, if I remember. Jimmy, this has been a truly a pleasure, man. I really appreciate you bearing through my ape and having a civil discussion. And I actually think I learned some really cool things, and 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 you've definitely given me a lot of food for thought. Um, I'll, I'll link all your books below and, you know, all the best to you. And I hope to connect with you again one day soon, Jimmy. All right. Thanks. All right. Thank you very much.